Praise be to God, my dear friends. I want to begin by telling you that I love you tremendously, very, very much. And I love you with the love of the Lord that is for your greater good, that is for eternal life. And that's why from the day I was ordained to the holy priesthood until now, and, and I'm vowed to the end of my days here on earth to give everything I have in service to God's holy people. And I want to share with you the marvelous gift of God's mercy. And that is defined by the Holy Confession. I went to the Holy Confession just a few days ago, as I often do. And the unique reality of the Holy Confession is that Obviously, it is the forgiveness of sins, but that is only the means to the end to which is our goal and the desire of God, and that is communion with God Himself. And the reason I say that is because the Holy Confession is to be renewed in the Holy Spirit. I had a priest explain to me one time, it's like when the Holy Spirit, the Lord Himself, rushed upon David when he was anointed. And the reality that takes place in the Holy Confession is that we are renewed to the state of our baptism or brought back to the state of our baptism. So there is only one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we are defined in that as sons and daughters of the Father. But the in the wonderful way of the Lord, by His mercy, that even though we are sinners and we continue to sin, we are renewed in the Holy Confession to the state of our baptism. We are made whole. We are purified. We are renewed. We are like a, a ground that is watered from the heavens and puts forth its growth. And it is so absolutely refreshing. I was praising God whenever I went to the Holy Confession. I was so refreshed and happy and alive because of life itself, the Lord Himself, the Holy Spirit. And it is necessary that way for all of us. I was speaking to a woman yesterday and she's a woman of faith and she asked uh, how often should I go to the Holy Confession Father I said well if it's a mortal sin that's a 911 but other than that it should be regularly if it pushes to six weeks or eight weeks or beyond that's already too long it's like my my cousin whom I love he always reminds me of that old commercial. Partner, how long has it been since you had a hot steaming bowl of Wolf Brand Chili? Well, that's too long. <laughs> that's what he tells me. I love my cousin. And it's true that we cannot allow for things to pass into length of time like that. We have to take our shelter our strength and our renewal in the fountains of life from the Lord. And that is namely the Holy Confession and the Holy Eucharist. That's why Father Clay hasn't missed one day of taking the Holy Communion in more than 20 years. Not one day. Not one day have I missed the Holy Mass in more than 20 years. That's pretty amazing. And so, 
I encourage you to think on those things. And I wanted to share with you the liturgy from that very day that I went to confession. Because it was a tremendous consolation from God. I even cried to myself at the goodness of God. Tears of gratitude and joy. From the book of the prophet Joel. Gird yourselves, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Come spread. Come spend the night in sackcloth, O ministers of God. The house of your God is deprived of offering and libation. Proclaim a fast, call an assembly. Gather the elders, all who dwell in the land, into the house of the Lord your God and cry to the Lord. And all the more, because of the wickedness of these times, as I did the examination of conscience and I was speaking to the priest, I told him, that I'm sorry for my shortcomings to God, especially amidst the, the wickedness of these times. It is necessary for the priest to cry to God, to recognize that the house of the Lord is on fire and to put on sackcloth and ashes and to do the ritual purifications and to engage in the battle. Like David the king, that is what won the heart of the Lord for that man that is why the Lord said of David he is a man after my own heart because he knew how to recognize things and he knew how to be to God and that's why we have to push ourselves to that same sentiment the house of God is deprived of offering and libation because of the sinfulness of these times which is surpassing to any other time. And because the ones that should be holy to God are in fact numbered among the most wicked. Alas, the day for near is the day of the Lord. And it comes as ruin from the Almighty. And we ask you, Lord, that even though those days and those things will rightly be tremendous. May you give us the strength to endure them and we welcome them because there is no other road to renewal except for the purification in fire. You know, Lord, more than anyone, the wickedness of the hearts of men in these days. And we also know or in some way we sense it, we can feel it. And that's why we welcome your chastisement, Lord. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all who dwell in the land tremble, because it will no doubt be a frightful day. And I myself will be terrified, as all of us will. The sacred author once said, when the Lord stood for judgment, the earth trembled and everything was still. Yes, it is near the day of darkness and of gloom, a day of clouds and somberness. Like dawn spreading over the mountains of people numerous and mighty, their like has not been from of old, nor will it be after them even to the years of distant generations. Let's see what the Lord has in store for us. But we draw strength and courage now from the words of the psalmist. The Lord will judge the world with justice, for He is the only just judge. And especially when you put it up against the measure of mindless people of these days, I was reading uh, a letter recently that from a power and from a position, a person in position of power, you know, and you see people, uh, you see priests getting uh, destroyed in these days. All it takes, I, I remember when I was in formation more than 
it must have been, well, probably 25 years ago, I was in formation to the holy priesthood. And there was one of the most holy priests that I've ever met in my, my whole life. You know, he was a man of heroic virtue and intellect and deep in his understanding to God and to all things. You know, and he was saying, and I, I thought it was quite strange at the time, but I believed everything he said. You know, and he said that uh, all it takes to take down a priest is an accusation. That's it. No proof, no trial, no, uh, as we know by, by Western law, due process. There's nothing like that. And that's how wicked men in power have weaponized their own sin, which is predominantly the sin of homosexuality. And that spills into every kind of perversion and lack of ability to think right in anything. Pretty much everything they do is wrong. And absolutely their, their, their mode of thought their philosophy is wrong. And they have no faith to God because their hearts are twisted. They're depraved people because of their own sin and their insistence on their own sin. They don't know anything about true confession. They don't know anything about approaching the mercy seat of the Lord because they are already steeped and irreversibly, in most cases, steeped in their own sin. Not that that takes any way, anything away from the mercy of God, but through sin and perpetual sin, the human person, their heart is hardened. Their mind is, is calcified. And, and they are unable to repent to God. God's mercy is even for the greatest sinner. But their deep wickedness is so entrenched that they will be the ones to refuse to repent. That's the way people are in hell. In hell, they don't repent. They may be suffering tremendously, but they curse God. They hate God. They are so hardened in their hatred for God that they curse God even from hell. You know, I had a, fr a friend who was a priest once and he used to debate with the, the devil himself, with Satan. And he, he would mock Satan in a way that he would tell him, you know, all you would have to do is repent and the Lord would forgive you. <laughs> and that's actually true. You know, the Lord who knows true repentance, see, we cannot just say anything to God. And, it, and, and that that measures authenticity. The Lord is the one who knows authenticity. Nothing is hidden from God. And if the prince of demons and the demons and the souls lost to hell were to repent, I believe that it would even be possible escape from hell. But what defines the inescapability from hell is the hardness of the hearts of the creatures who rebel to God. It's not God's mercy that is not afforded. It is their inability and refusal to recognize truth, to submit themselves to it, to repent and to have conversion. And there are many men in our time and men in powerful positions. You know, I read in this letter, you know, we judge this, we saw this, you know, we have evidence to this, even though there's no evidence to anything from civil authorities, they make these, these claims and they put it to the people as if the people should believe it. <laughs> these men operate, I say, in half truths and lies because long have they been sons of their father, the father of lies. That's the devil himself. And these guys are devils. And they're the worst of devils. 
I've told you before that I serve in the prisons or that my my parish and my parishioners, which I have been separated from, are the, the prisoners. And obviously they're in prison for a reason. I mean, there are a few who are authentically innocent. You've probably seen that movie, The Shawshank Redemption, numbered among uh, Father Clay's top five movies of all time. I love that movie. And uh, the man was innocent. But most persons in prison have committed serious crimes. But they have uh, faith to God. And they believe in God. And they repent of their crimes. And I guarantee you that the offense to God of the wicked ones that I'm speaking of right now far surpasses the offense, the crime, the unspeakable things that even anyone in, in, in the prisons of men have committed. That's how wicked they are. Surpassing in wickedness to anything you can even imagine. And even, even if you were to see a glimpse of the depth of their wickedness, you would probably faint or even uh, cease to live like a heart attack. It might cause for you a myocardial infarction if you were to see the fullness of the picture as God sees. That's how wicked these persons are. And it is uh, mostly unknown to people. People are unaware of it. In large part due to their lack of perception for their lack of communion to God in many ways. Even though in their unknowing and innocence they may be, say they believe in God and to a certain degree do. But they are left in the cloud of unknowing. And that's why they cannot see these things. But those things will certainly come into light in the fullness of time. And we anticipate to that day. The coming of light itself, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great and terrible day when all things will be made visible. All things will be known. And on that day, it will certainly be known. And that will be a great day. And until then, we resolve ourselves to faithfully continue to walk the line to God. Even with our face in the dirt, suffering, enduring the hardships that is shared in commonality with the entire body of Christ in this time. St. Paul would be the one to say that the entire body of Christ is sharing in the same sufferings. That's why this is such a bad time. And that's why I encourage you perpetually to take your confidence to God. To not be disheartened and to not be discouraged. In fact, it is most exhilarating knowing that the day of vindication draws ever near. With each passing day, that, that time is closer. The time in which the yoke of oppression will be removed from the backs of God's people. And the day when right justice is affected. That's why it's said in the sacred scriptures, the righteous will rejoice for all eternity at the sight of the burning of the wicked in the eternal fires of hell. What a magnificent, what a magnificent victory. And because of the offense and the offense that we see in real time, I talk to people all the time who are tremendously offended by these things in many, many ways. You know, there are things that, that destroy their whole life because of these bad actors, because of these jokers. The Lord will judge the world with justice, the psalmist said. Yes, indeed. I will give you thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. I will declare all your wondrous deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. You rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. Their name you blotted out forever. Oh yes, oh yes. The nations are sunk in the pit they have made. 
in the snare that they set, their foot is caught. The people, that's why Father Clay constantly is uh, burdened with the sufferings of God's people because I love God's people. I love the sinner. That's why I give my life as a priest. That's why you ask anybody whom, I'm, whom I have ever served as a people. <clears throat> and if they're authentic, they will tell you. Even if they don't like me that much, they will tell you that, uh, you know, even in Father Clay's poverty, he did the best that he could. And that's true because that's right. I am a poor man, but I have always done the best that I could because I love God and I love God's people. And there will be those who who hate me uh, in a pointed way because they refuse to to release those things that are in opposition to the truth to God, mostly uh, their moral depravity. Like, for example, the refusal to, to recognize the holiness of marriage or their refusal to, uh, you know, let go of uh, their own uh, immoral perversions in whatever way that might be. And that's why there are many who profess to be homosexuals who hate me. But there are also many who love me. Because <laughs> I love them. And I walk with them in their struggle. And in fact, I've, I've told them many times, and I will say it to you. When I'm dealing with people who struggle with the temptation to same-sex attraction, but they recognize that it's not acceptable to God, they believe in God, and they fight to to discipline themselves not to do that, even though sometimes they may be unsuccessful, I am most solicitous to those persons. I am most moved in my own human heart by the faith and desire of those persons as they're beset by the most tremendous heat and aggressiveness of that temptation which surpasses in my opinion to all other temptations i don't know it intimately because i don't have that temptation praise god praise god but i recognize their plight and i love them and that's the way to every single sinner and there are some people who say well i don't like the way he looks in that cowboy hat or i never seen a priest wear a cowboy hat or i don't like the way he talks or he was, he seemed rough to me. Everybody has their, their own opinions and that's no problem. That's no problem at all. But the problem is when we don't recognize truth to God. And when we don't live by truth to God. Even through our poverty. That's a big time problem. And that's why I cry for God's people in this time of tremendous suffering. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has set up his throne of judgment. He judges the world with justice. He governs the people with equity. And when the Lord says equity, he means it in the fullness of truth, not in the perversion of those who make that claim. The woke, the progressives, those who know neither anything to God nor anything to truth, nor care anything about equity and authenticity. Those are wicked people. But the Lord, that's another story. He knows equity and he means equity. So as we see these things, we are not disillusioned for. We know that the prince of the world will be cast out. And as Jesus said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself. Magnificent. We do believe, Lord. We trust you. That's why we are not, we are not discouraged to, to throw off the cross. And we pay heed to your holy gospel. When Jesus had driven out a demon. Some in the crowd said, by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he drives out demons. And these were religious leaders in the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there are many religious leaders. 
in our own time who are of the same substance. In fact, I label them as the Pharisees on steroids. And so their wickedness is, is absolutely surpassing. And they use those same age-old techniques from the Marxist himself, from the God of the Marxist, from the devil. So they create diversions. They tell half-truths and lies. And that's exactly what they were doing to Jesus. They make accusations in half-truths and in lies. And they hated Jesus. The same as the modern-day Pharisees do. And that's why it's important for you to understand that you may grasp why it is they do what they do and how it is they do what they do. And that you may be able to see, see clearly and to the degree that it is afforded to you. That is your capability that you may wage war to, to them, to it. In other words, that you may engage, engage effectively in what St. Paul called the good fight. The fight for Holy Mother Church. The fight for God. Others to test the Lord asked him for a sign from heaven, but he knew their thoughts. And he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be laid waste. And that's why the kingdom that these sodomites have built will absolutely fall. It is untenable and unsustainable. And they constantly are in fear because of that very reality. They know it will come crashing down on them. It's only a matter of when and where. <laughs> Praise God. And if Satan, the Lord said, is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand for you? Say that it is by Beelzebub that I cast out demons. If then I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your own people drive them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Amen, Lord. When a strong man, fully armed, fully armed, guards his palace, his possessions are safe. But when strong, one stronger than he attacks and overcomes him, he takes away the armor on which he relied and distributes the spoils. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And apart from the sufferings that we can en endure by stronger people in this life, in this world, in the natural order, you know, that's one thing. But absolutely we have confidence that to the promises of the Lord. And that's why we have to stay to the Lord. He is the only true victory. That's why I perpetually encourage you, don't let anything separate you from the Lord. Stay close to God. That's why it is necessary for you to go to the Holy Confession. That you may prepare yourself for the meal. And that you may feast in truth and authenticity on the bread of life. Panis Angelicus. The bread of angels. The Holy Eucharist. Because that's the only thing that's going to protect us from the demons and their minions. When an unclean spirit goes out of someone, it roams through arid regions searching for rest. But finding none, it says, I shall return to my home from which I came. But on returning, it finds it swept clean and put into order. Then it goes back and finds seven other spirits more wicked than itself who move in and dwell there. And the last condition of that man is worse than the first. And that's why I plead with you to understand and to insist upon yourself and your family with urgency to go to the Holy Confession and to renew your faith and devotion to God authentically. That is the only thing that will save you. And any other facade of protection or safety that you put to yourself in this world, you will be absolutely disappointed and you will be terrified when it crashes down. Build your house with stones of the Lord. Build and 
and strengthen and fortify the city of God, your home, your family, your friends. Be a people of God because nothing of this world, nothing else of this world will save you. And in fact, anything else of this world will make every effort to deceive you and to lead you to ultimate separation from God. That's hell. Hell absolutely exists. And there are residents there. And even many residents. And there are some who rightfully belong there. And there are many whom I weep for that will, were led there by these blind leaders of the blind. The loss of salvation of many souls will be leveled against them. Because we live in a time of antichrists, agents who are intentionally against the gospel. As evidenced right in your face what is taking place in Rome in this very time, the synod on synodality, there are many antichrists present there in concerted effort to destroy the church from within and principally to make abomination to and to break down that which is unbreakable the Lord himself the blessed sacrament so they are losers they always have been losers and they will lose but the collateral damage of human souls is what concerns to me. And that's why I tell you these things. I love you and we give you the blessing. On this beautiful day in October, as we prepare to celebrate in truth All Hallows Eve, the Eve of all the Holy Ones that has also been perverted by this culture and this generation to what has come to be as Halloween for a month. I have already seen people's yards decorated with demons and wicked things, things of the darkness. That is not the substance of All Hallows Eve, October the 31st. The substance of All Hallows Eve is festive celebration and anticipation to the following day, November the 1st, All Saints Day. The, the day to honor all the hallowed ones. And that's why October the 31st has in long Christian tradition been celebrated with festivity all Hallows Eve. But our petition to God right now in this blessing is that in fact each of you and many will be ultimately numbered among those saints that we look forward to honor on November the 1st. That there will be many from our time numbered to the holy, spotless, pure throng of virgins, the white-robed army of martyrs, and the holy ones. That's our petition. And to that end, the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Adios. Bye.